Hey, Razvax here. Today we're going to do a quick video in between review cycles. Uh, so a lot of stuff is going on to the guns and getting the first rounds onto them. Thus it's going to be a bit till I get like my main content, my reviews, uh, even first looks and stuff like that. So you're going to get a lot of POU videos, gear videos, and whatever the fuck this video is considered. Today I'm going to be looking at storing magazines loaded versus unloaded. It came up a lot on the Discord, so I figured I would give my version of this, right? There are a couple videos like this on the internet, but I, for once, actually uh, might be moderately qualified to talk about this topic. I am a material science engineer, or at least I will be in a couple weeks uh, if I don't fuck up the finals, which is a big if. Uh, and then I have to find a job after that. So, uh, hey, if you're hiring in the, uh, the Midwest area... <laughs> Anyways... Regardless, this topic that I'm going to go over, material wear, specifically metal wear, is something that is a cornerstone of metallurgical, civil, and a lot of other engineering disciplines, and you learn about this stuff fairly early on. However, first off, practically speaking, uh, I think a lot of people overthink this. Magazines are wear items. You use them until there's issues, and then you put them in a box and never look at them again. And if you train regularly and don't baby your mags, you're gonna burn through about one to two mags per year if you have roughly six to 10 training mags. And most of that damage will actually have nothing to do with the spring. You will probably do feed lip damage or around the feed lip area well before you have issues with the spring. Uh, another mechanism for failure on magazines that aren't really material related is the followers, because they're all plastic, generally begin to wear out as in you kinda file it down after repeated bolt drops on uh, empty magazines, right, when you're done, and you will round out the follower, causing your bolt to not always lock to the rear. I found these two mechanisms generally wear out a mag well before the spring is close to being done. But the TLDR of this whole entire talk is super simple. Magazines are going to wear or self-destruct through normal usage, well before your springs are typically going to give out. And even if they do give out, who cares? They're $15 items and you expect to burn through them, right? You should have fresh mags for your quote unquote duty use and training mags. And as the training mags wear out, you replace them with your duty mags and your duty mags get new mags. Make sense? All right. You should never really get to a point where spring failure is a big deal. But let's get into the academics of it. Why exactly it's not a huge deal uh, when it comes to storing magazines loaded versus unloaded, and what actually causes failure in the spring specifically. So let's get into the facts. The brass facts. There are, roughly speaking, three-ish modes of failure that we're going to be talking about today. There are more, uh, and then we're going to kind of have a little bit of overlap, but we're going to talk about three modes of failure, right? The number one mode of failure is exceeding your yield strength or even exceeding, exceeding your fracture strength. Second mode of failure is creep, and third mode of failure is cyclic. There are more, but we're not going to get into it because uh, you probably don't give a shit <laughs> when it comes to using your magazine. Number one mode of failure, and this is what most people actually think is happening when their magazines fail or anything else fails, and that is exceeding the yield or fracture strength of the material. This is a stress strain curve. The stress, which is on the y axis, oh, and by the way, we're in paint because we're in a ultra high production value video over here. But yeah, we're in paint. Uh, stress is basically the force applied. It's technically force over area, but we don't really need to talk about that. Just imagine stress is kind of force over area and strain is how much the object moves, uh, bends, so to speak, right? So imagine you're bending uh, your pen or a paper clip, whatever. You apply a force, right? You're bending it and the object bends. Right? That's all this graph describes. In the, there is this first region right here, which is typically where most metals are designed to operate in, or most materials, I should say. As you bend your object, and you apply more and more force, uh, the object begins to bend, and it's in a very straight, linear fashion. Once you get past this point of force to area, you will exceed your yield strength, and you will enter the plastic deformation region. Real quick though, this boxed area is called the elastic deformation region where you bend the object and it will elastically return back to its original shape and size or whatever. Right, you know this, bend a 
wooden pencil, bend a paper clip, whatever. If you bend it a little bit and let go, it will return back to its original shape and you won't even notice any changes. That is the elastic deformation region. However, once you exceed the elastic deformation region, you enter the plastic deformation region. And it's worth noting that in the plastic deformation region, plastic just refers to how the material is behaving. It's not specific to plastics, right? So you get to the plastic deformation region and the object will now permanently deform, right? You bend your paper clip, you get to a point where it bends so much that it will not return to its original shape. This is considered the plastic deformation region. As you might imagine, most material design is balanced or centered around not exceeding your yield strength. Because while the, the object can take more force by entering the plastic region uh, all the way up to its ultimate tensile strength, uh, generally this isn't done because the object is generally expended at this point. Okay, so why is this important? Well. It's important to understand that your spring, because their engineers are smart, design their object to never exceed, exceed yield strength. So no matter what you do to your spring, while it's inside your magazine, you cannot apply a strong enough strain to exceed the yield strength. Thus, you will never bend your spring bad enough that it will cause permanent damage to the spring. So why do springs wear out then? Well, there are, other, there are two other mechanisms we'll talk about today creep and cycles. We're going to talk about cycles first. So technically, I misspoke when I said um, going as long as you stay below the yield strength, you will not do permanent damage. You will not practically be doing any noticeable damage to the object that you can even detect on a measuring device or to your naked eye. Every time you apply a load to a material, right, you put stress onto the material, it bends ever so slightly, you are putting a cycle onto the object. And then when you let go, it relaxes back to the original point where you started perfect dimensions. Except, it actually doesn't. It will move ever so slightly down the curve. This is heavily exaggerated, but if you imagine a percent of a percent of a percent, the object will move down the curve ever so slightly, which in order to stay in line, will lower its yield strength ever so slightly. And you do this enough, and we're talking hundreds of thousands, millions even, of cycles, you will noticeably begin to impact your yield strength to the point where if you put enough cycles onto an object, it will begin to behave worse than the original material. How does this play out with magazines? Well, every time you load the magazine and then unload the magazine, so full compression, and then no compression, or some compression and then uncompression. You will add a tiny infinitesimal amount of cycle damage. We'll just call it, it's not really called like that, but we'll call it cycle damage. So roughly speaking, most springs of average materials will have something in the neighborhood of 15,000 to 20,000 cycles before you begin to have noticeable degradation of effects. And there are some better materials, I don't think springs are made out of these, that can withstand something in the neighborhood of 100,000 cycles before having noticeable effects on the material. 15,000 to 20,000 is a lot, but it's also something that you can reasonably expect to achieve in a lifetime of a magazine, right? So every time, if you put a bullet in, a single bullet into your magazine and unload it, that is considered one cycle. Put five rounds in, unload one, that's still actually not an unload, so you have to get rid of all five to achieve that singular cycle. But if you do a lot of dry fire, you do a lot of shooting, you do a lot of, a lot of messing around with your magazines, you will reasonably achieve 15,000 to 20,000 cycles, but it will take a long time. Okay, on to the, I guess, title of the video. Why does leaving a magazine loaded not matter? This gets into the second mode of failure, and that's called creep. And it's that if you bring a metal up to a higher temperature, at least halfway to its melting point, and apply a force, that metal will begin to permanently deform, right? So even though you're not exceeding your yield strength, if you bring the temperature up to, let's say, of like 1000, 1000 F, give or take, right? Because I think steel melts at roughly 2000, 2300, depends on the alloy. 
Uh, if you bring it up to this point and apply a force, even though you are not exceeding your yield strength, um, you will notice that the metal will permanently deform. And that is called creep. Now, I don't think any of us are storing our magazines at 1000 Fahrenheit, but it turns out, um, after studying this mechanism, creep occurs at all temperatures. It's only high temperatures that drastically, exponentially so, exaggerate the effects of creep. So with that, we're able to somewhat, emphasis on somewhat, reverse engineer and note that metals, specifically, but other materials, have creep at room temperature. But frankly speaking, there isn't huge amounts of data on how much creep you're experiencing at this low temperature, and it is so small as to be infinitesimally unstudiable. <laughs> So, what does this actually functionally mean? Well, this might actually make the boomers happy for once. Yes, there is a mechanism that where if you keep a loaded mag loaded over, say, 50 years, and you have an unloaded magazine that sits next to it, the loaded magazine will have probably a shorter spring than the unloaded magazine over 50 years due to room temperature creep. But... Functionally speaking, this difference is so small as to be mostly irrelevant because no one is actually storing magazines for 50 years. We don't even know, 556 five, is probably not even gonna be around in 50 years. You're gonna do more damage in a single range session, let's say 20 cycles out of your 15,000 cycles versus a decade of leaving a magazine to experience that room temperature creep. Shit, if we're only storing it for a decade, you might actually do more damage to your magazine when you unload it to leave it in storage and then reload it when you need it at the end of the 10 years than you will from preventing creep from taking place. Yeah. All right, that's with some brass facts. Understand, this was meant to be 100% academic and right, kind of explain the mechanisms of material deformation and where, because fundamentally, this is a case where your experience just trumps all of this. And I'm telling you right now, the biggest mode of failure for your magazines is you forgetting them on the range and losing them, right? These are wear items. Replace them when they give you shit. Uh, replace them when they look at you funny. Replace them when you lose a match because you're angry. Whatever, they're $15. Uh, don't worry about it too much. Anyway, that's been some brass facts for you. Hopefully you found whatever this video was interesting. Uh, we'll see you later.